There is a large volume of scholarly literature on the Didache. Almost all treats it as a thoroughly Christian work. However, scholars are not necessarily right about everything. It is a bit mean to fault scholars as a group, but why should that stop us? One of the most obvious things is that scholars are paid to produce content, and they certainly do that. Why say something in a hundred words when you can say it in a thousand? More relevant, though, are two things that they tend to do. One is to dive into the weeds quickly without much general overview. So with a text, they will pause briefly on the generalities and then dive into the specifics of meaning of particular words and phrases. It is a bit doubtful how much microanalysis texts like the Didache can really bear. You have to assume that the authors chose their words very carefully in order to impute that subtle differences in phrasing imply correspondingly subtle differences in the author's understanding, and I doubt that is true to the extent that scholarship often implies. Note parallels with Paul's Brother of the Lord. The other thing scholars do is to contextualise. If you're going to write umpteen thousand words about a ten-word verse in a text, much of that is going to be about putting it into the context of the received understanding of the history of the time. That effort to contextualise applies a received context. It does not usually challenge the received context. These observations apply to the Didache in particular, and the entire historicity versus mythicism debate as well. They apply to quite a lot of disciplines and mean that the broad strokes of the received historical narrative are frequently considerably more fragile than you'd expect when examining the volume of work supporting them. Mark's Gospel is highly historicising with multiple references locating Jesus in time, place and person. Paul's letters are not, with no references locating Jesus in time or place and one debatable reference to person, James the Lord's brother. If the Didache originates from the same religion and predates both Paul and Mark's Gospels, then maybe its Christology will help determine which Jesus came first. And so it might, were it not for one rather odd thing. The Didache does not seem to be about Jesus. In fact, it's got hardly any Christology in it at all. And those references to Jesus that it does have are arguably late additions. To see how odd this is, let's have a look at the opening lines of some of Paul's letters. Romans, from Paul, a slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart from the Gospels of God. This gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. 1 Corinthians, from Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Jesus Christ and called to be saints with all those in every place who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. 2 Corinthians, from Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, with all the saints who are in Achaia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Galatians, from Paul, an apostle, not from men, not by human agency, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brothers with me to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. First Thessalonians, from Paul and Silvanius and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. You get the picture? Let's have a look at the Gospels, how they start. Mark, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it was written in the prophets Isaiah. Matthew, this is the record of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, blah, 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 blah. Luke and John take longer to meander around to mentioning Jesus. Luke's first got to tell us what a good historian he is, and John starts talking about the word before it becomes clear that the word means Jesus. But all of these letters and books are thoroughly about and centred on Jesus. If we now turn to the Didache, this starts with... There are two ways, one of life, one of death, each having great differences between them. The way of life is this. First, you must love the one who formed you. Second, you must love your neighbour in the same manner as yourself. Do not do to others what you yourself would not want done to you. And these are our teachings. Bless the ones who curse you. Pray for your enemies. Fast for your persecutors. Do not expect a great reward if you only love those who love you. Do the Gentiles not conduct themselves accordingly? 
but if you practice love to those who hate you, your enemies will vanish. And on and on it goes through a load of commandments and warnings and only gets around to even mentioning Jesus in chapter 9. The Didache was lost to scholarship in antiquity and only reappeared in 1873 when it was found in the Jerusalem Codex by Bryennios. Since then, other texts of it have been found. The earliest is a small scrap of 4th century papyrus that contains a few words. A couple of pages from a 5th century Coptic translation have also been discovered and a Georgian version came to light and was then lost, but that is probably not a different line of transmission from the Jerusalem Codex. There are some citations of it in the Church Fathers. There's a work called the Apostolic Constitutions, Book 7 of which is based on the Didache, but is an expanded and heavily Christianised version, with references to Jesus appearing throughout. This was known about but not recognised as being based on the Didache until Bryennios is find. So we have a number of texts and that means we can look for variant readings in those parts of the text covered by more than one source, and there are several. One of these is in the title, Church Fathers refer to the work as the teachings of the Apostles, and that is probably the earliest version of the title. The word twelve was added later, to make it the teachings of the twelve Apostles. There are also variations in the references to Jesus. There are four references in total. One of these is absent from one early version, and another that refers to Jesus Christ in the Jerusalem Codex simply refers to Jesus. Other variant readings follow the same pattern, suggesting that variations have arisen because things have been added to an original text, so later versions have the additions and earlier versions do not. They don't seem to be comparable deletions. So as the references to Jesus are prominent amongst the variant readings, could it be that all the references to Jesus are late additions? Another reason for believing this is that all of the references to Jesus are in some way redundant in the sentences that they appear in and all are close together in the Didache and closely related to each other in meaning. In all, Jesus is added as a qualifier to a person who's already been defined in the text as God's servant. If it's true that these were all late editions, then the original didn't contain any references to Jesus at all. It does refer to a number of entities who could be associated with a Jesus Christ-like figure, and no doubt were by early Christians. The two Didache chapters where Jesus is mentioned are 9 and 10, which are similar Eucharistic prayers. They likely represent different versions that have evolved from the same prayer, rather than different prayers that have converged onto the same topic. Previously, I've used Ivan Lewis's 1998 translation of his reconstruction of the original Didache. But he, with good reason, omits all references to Jesus. I want to illustrate where these references occur in the Jerusalem Codex, so we'll switch to the Roberts and Donaldson translation of chapters 9 and 10. Chapter 9 on the Eucharist. Now, concerning the Eucharist, give thanks this way. First concerning the cup. We thank thee, our Father, for the holy vine of David thy servant, which you madest known to us through Jesus thy servant. To thee be the glory for ever. And concerning the broken bread. We thank thee, our Father, for the life and knowledge which you madest known to us through Jesus thy servant. To thee be the glory for ever, even as this broken bread was scattered over the hills, and was gathered together and became one, so let thy church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into thy kingdom. For thine is the glory and the power through Jesus Christ for ever. But let no one eat or drink of your Eucharist unless they have been baptised into the name of the Lord, for concerning this also the Lord has said, Give not that which is holy to the dogs. So that last line again is likely a later addition. And then chapter 10 is also a Eucharist prayer. But after you are filled, give thanks this way. We thank you, Holy Father, for thy holy name, which you did cause to tabernacle in our hearts, and for the knowledge and faith and immortality which you made us known to us through Jesus thy servant. To thee be the glory for ever, thou, Master Almighty, didst create all things for thy name's sake. You gavest food and drink to men for enjoyment, that they may give thanks to thee. But to us you didst freely give spiritual food and drink, and life eternal through thy servant. Before all things we thank thee that you are mighty. To thee be the glory for ever. Remember, Lord, thy church, to deliver it from all evil, and to make it perfect in thy love. And gather it from the four winds, and sanctified for thy kingdom, 
which thou have prepared for it. For thine is the power and the glory for ever. Let grace come, let this world pass away. Hosanna to the God of David. If anyone is holy, let him come. If anyone is not so, let him repent. Maranatha, Amen. But permit the prophets to make thanksgiving as much as they desire. Again, another later edition at the end. There are significant differences between this Eucharist and the versions of Paul and Mark. The Didache never equates the wine with Jesus' blood, nor the bread with his body. The wine and bread still have symbolic meanings, but they're quite different meanings. Then there's what the Didache doesn't say. It doesn't refer to Jesus' death, let alone his ministry or any other earthly activities. Also, it reverses the normal Christian order of bread and wine. The original Jewish ceremonial meal has the same order as the Didache. A lot has been made of this because the Essenes of the Dead Sea Scrolls used the Christian rather than the Jewish and Didache order. Then the bit about scattering the bread fragments and gathering in the church are symbolic of messianic belief but Jewish, not Christian messianism. So if it's true that the Didache is a pre-Pauline Christian relic of uncertain date, it's got precious little of the Jesus we know in it. We have no death of Jesus, no vicarious atonement, and a completely different Eucharistic theology. We have a couple of hints that Jesus could be a servant through which we have known these things, or a prophet role, but that doesn't seem consistent with the saving utility of Jesus without the crucifixion atonement story. Whether the Jesus references were added to the Didache late or early, referring to a Jesus as a servant of God seems to imply a historical person, but it perhaps doesn't add any new data points as Matthew, the gospel with which the Didache has most in common, also describes Jesus as a servant of God in Matthew 12, 18-21, which is a quote from Isaiah 42. So the fleeting references to Jesus in the Didache don't really help us resolve whether the early church considered him to be a spiritual or human entity. But that's not all we can say, because the Didache looks very much like Jewish sectarian literature containing almost none of the theological innovations that would later characterise Christianity. It does contain a rather minor relaxation of the requirement to follow the Jewish law, and it contains a meal of some significance that appears to have been co-opted by Paul into his Eucharist. And it probably does represent a stage of Christianity before Paul got his hands on it. It gives no impression of any founding person, let alone a founding person with life events of theological significance. The servant is credited with showing them the way, but nevertheless there is a stark contrast between the Jesus-centred approach of early Christian literature and the Didache, which makes it look as though Jesus, whether he existed or not, falls foul of a different criteria for historicity, and that is that he founded Christianity because the Didache makes it look as though Jesus was inserted into a pre-existing religion, presumably by Paul. Arguments from silence tend to be weak, especially when that silence can only be achieved by interpreting certain contentious points in one particular way, as is true of the silence of Paul on the historical Jesus and also the silence of the Didache on Jesus generally. And these arguments often don't carry much traction in public discourse. But private reading of these texts with specific questions in mind, does make these silences look very odd. I think the Didache probably does predate the Gospels, but it doesn't really advance the historicity of Jesus' question much. What it does do, however, is hint at how little we understand the true origins of Christianity.